want to welcome you uh, here this morning. Please be seated. Uh, we just want to welcome you here this morning, whether you're here for the first time, the hundredth time, the thousandth time, whether you're watching online. Uh, we're just really glad you're here. And uh, at this time, if you'd like, you can take out your phones, uh, check in on social media, let people know that you're here. Uh, and then after that, please silence them and put them away for the remainder of the service. And uh, in a moment, we'll say a prayer for the service. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, we just come before you this morning. Uh, so grateful that we're here to worship you, God. Uh, it's the most amazing thing that we could possibly do. Uh, we just thank you for the singing and the worshiping that we've already done, and for the worship that's going to come, God, in the form of singing, uh, communion, uh, the service. Uh, we pray that you just speak to the people speaking this morning, God. Uh, just let everybody walk out of here with what you know they need to hear, God. Um, that's our prayer for this morning. Thank you so much for loving us and blessing us in all the ways that you do. Thank you. 
get through this as unemotionally as possible, but bear with me. So the past uh, two months have given me a much deeper appreciation of the cross. Uh, the appreciation of how, just how selfless Jesus was in, in spite of uh, all his pain and suffering and what, what can, what, just an unimaginable torture that he suffered uh, on the cross, yet he wasn't focused on his own suffering, his own needs. In 1 Peter chapter 2, and I, and I know that there's, there's a lot of suffering going on amongst us in different ways, um, but we're called to First Peter 2.21 says, To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When, he, when they hurled insults at him, he did not re retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. This has been uh, an unusually challenging year for Paula and I, especially for her. Um, as she's broken, she's had uh, six bone fractures in the last, uh, in a five month period of time. Uh, um, at the end of January, um, during a winter hiking accident, uh, she broke two ribs and she um, shattered um, two bones in her arm. Um, and having uh, gone through a similar um, break myself 25 years ago, uh, I know just how um, difficult it was to get all that range of motion back and how painful it was. And um, I, I think I was able to coach her through it, but I also felt that pain so deeply. Um, and then on, uh, um, at the beginning of uh, July, uh, she slipped uh, and fractured her kneecap, breaking her patella in half. Um, and we were, after we went to the emergency room, we were sent home to await surgery the following week. Uh, but 12 hours later, she uh, had, had, um, had gotten up during the night. She had a, a drop in blood pressure, and, uh, and she uh, took another very devastating fall. Um, and this was a game changer. Uh, she, she, uh, she fell backwards full force. Uh, into the outside corner of the shower wall, um, uh, split her head wide open. She um, and she fractured her back. And when I turned on the light, and I, I just horrified, I'd seen a pool of blood behind her head as she lay on the floor in a in a catatonic state, unconscious. Uh, I, I was I was absolutely horrified, thinking. Uh, I'm going to lose my life here. We spent eight days in the hospital uh, advocating for her, uh, going through uh, many testing procedures. I didn't realize there were so many tests they could do. I didn't realize there were so many physicians, different specialists that, um, that we needed to see. Um, it, it was a constant flow of, of um, meeting with doctors, um, looking at treatment options, considering other options. Um, then finally we got out of the hospital, and uh, after we got her pain managed and her knee was able to be surgically repaired while she was in the hospital. Um, but I was feeling really physically and emotionally drained. Um, through uh, lack of sleep. Uh, I spent um, uh, endless hours waking up at night um, having um, flashbacks of what happened, uh, uh, feeling um, just thinking she, she, can't, she can't afford another accident again, um, and, and how can I protect her? 
So bringing her back home raised many questions. You know, would I be able to take care of her? You know, would I be able to keep her safe? Will she be able to maneuver through the simple tasks that we normally just take for granted? Can I provide all the care she needs, the cooking, the cleaning, the shopping, the laundry, the doctor's appointments? You know, I love my wife, and I can't imagine how difficult life would be without her. I was feeling guilty for having caused some of these injuries. You know, I felt guilty for causing, pushing her on the hike, and I may have pushed her a little. Pushing her hard. Pushing her hard. And I think that because she was trying to keep up with me, that led to an injury. Overflowing the sink when she slipped and broke her knee. That was my fault. That was on me. And I felt guilty for that. I was feeling the burden of having to take care of her and to protect her. She could no longer meet any of my own personal needs, as she has always been so good at doing for me. I allowed myself to get caught up in my own suffering, and it only produced self-pity. And often I could treat her like she was a burden. And, you know, the trauma that Paula suffered was visible. The trauma that I suffered wasn't visible. I was still horrified by that fall, by that last fall. Patience, gentleness, kindness, perseverance, self-denial, they weren't at the top of my personal growth list at that point. But God knew. God knew exactly what I needed to learn from all this. And his greatest lesson to me was understood when I looked at Jesus on the cross. I can only imagine what Jesus saw and felt as he hung in agony on the cross. His friends weren't there emotionally, but him, like mine, were. Jewish leaders who were now mocking him, reveling in their victory of finally silencing their greatest opposition. Roman citizens who loved the bloody day of the Colosseum could get their fill today. Vendors who saw an opportunity to turn a quick profit at this well-attended event. Some groups of people who had followed him around, now curious about today's events. People passing by and wanting to get a good look so they could tell their friends. A few of his disciples at a distance, with a look of fear on their faces, in the shadows, questioning their faith. Those just shouting chants and mocking him along with the rest of the crowd. Just another day of work for the Roman soldiers who were casting lots for the clothes they had stripped off him. Common thieves on his left and right also hurling insults at him, so close that he could feel the pain of their own suffering. And his mother, with John by her side, along with some other women and family. And in the midst of all this, he thought nothing of his own needs. He only uttered the words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. To the thieves, he said, truly, I tell you that today you will be with me in paradise. And he said to his mother and John, as he saw them standing there, probably as close as the soldiers would allow them, to your woman, here is your son, and to John, here is your mother. No threats, no retaliation, only forgiveness. And concern for the care of his mother. So the question is, where are you standing today in reference to the cross? You know, if Jesus were looking down from the cross at you, um, what would he what would he see today? Um, and whatever your circumstances are right now, what is Jesus trying to teach you? Um, would you see in your heart today 
selfishness, resentment, or we see humility and gratitude. Let's go to the cross. Let's pray. And uh, thank, thank God for this, um, for, for uh, providing the cross for our forgiveness. Father, we're just so grateful for all that you do for us. Uh, Father, we see such an incredible example of uh, of how we need to be during suffering, the way we need to trust you, the way Jesus trusted you on the cross. Uh, Father, we're, we're thankful for this um, for this bread, which represents Jesus' broken body, and also um, the wine, the uh, grape juice that that um, represents uh, the blood that He sacrificed for us. And Father, we're just grateful. Uh, Father, help us to worship you um, uh, today. Um, and help us to, to really look at our own hearts and really see where do we stand before your cross. Yes, we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
service and now is an opportunity to give back to God. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we're, we're just grateful for everything you've given us. Um, just, uh, uh, Father, we, uh, we, don't, we don't deserve uh, forgiveness. Uh, Father, there's just uh, so much that you've given all of us in our lives, Father. Um, Father, help us to give back um, with hearts that, that uh, are, are uh, happy to give. And Father, let us give sacrificially, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Tom. Uh, join me in uh, thanking Jerry for leading us. For that, uh, we have uh, uh, a couple things to go through here. Hopefully, you have one of these, and you got a second sheet uh, as well today. And so, I uh, just want to go over some of this stuff. Uh, but next Sunday, as it says here, the Boston Church's 40th anniversary service. Next Sunday, we will not be meeting here, but uh, we will be meeting at the Songus Arena in Lowell, and that's what this sheet is all about. This additional sheet gives you more information on that service. Uh, times and places and what to bring or not to bring. Uh, so that will be next Sunday. So don't show up here next Sunday. Uh, and uh, and let your yeah, if, let friends and, and family, anybody else know who may not be here today, <clears throat> so that they don't show up here. Excuse me, next Sunday. Um, also, uh, as you notice, Rush Week is underway. We, uh, as it says here, are you ready to get your campus on? Well, we've already been getting it on. Uh, at Worcester St uh, WPI this past week, and uh, and so can, uh, all the Bible talks in the church, they're all coming out one night a week just to help out with our campus ministry to really get it off the ground, and uh, and so please be uh, planning to, this week we're going to be at Clark University, and so, uh, and so please see uh, Felipe or call him, text him, get a hold of him. Uh, if you would like to be participating in that and have your Bible talk come out to that. Um, boy, there's a lot going on. This Wednesday, we're a congregational midweek, so we're all back together this Wednesday night. And, uh, and we'll be introducing, it says, get ready for 938. It's coming. Well, this Wednesday, we introduce Project 938. And so what is that? Come back Wednesday night, and you'll find out. Uh, but to, it's also a day of prayer and fasting for the church. And so... Uh, this Wednesday, it says, a day of prayer and fasting for our brothers and sisters here in the Worcester Church as we begin this project. So what in the world is that? Right now, just be praying for one another, and then we'll come back and explain it all Wednesday night. Uh, this, uh, today, not this Sunday, today, after service, there'll be a family group leaders and assistants meeting right back in here. Uh, you'll notice Kids Kingdom, we're filling up the spots, but there's still a few more spots needed to be filled. Kate is shaking her head. So uh, three more spots, please fill in for the Kids Kingdom rotation coming up. Uh, we have an apple orchard service coming up. Next Saturday, we have an opportunity to serve at Maine South. Amen. And so uh, please uh, get a hold of uh, John Mindersma for that. Um, so also, and you notice there's prayer requests and so forth. Let me add one prayer request if I could. And that is for those who have been impacted or we know are going to be impacted by the hurricane that is uh, going to be hitting the U.S. coastline here and is already hitting the Bahamas, I guess, and as they were saying is now it's a Category 4 or going to be a Category 5. Or it's going to be a big deal. And so please uh, keep those folks in your prayers as well this week. Um, we have a special uh, welcome today. Uh, today uh, we uh, officially welcome into the church Ida and Marcella. And so if they could come on up. They've been here now for the last week and a half, two weeks, but today we get to officially welcome them in, which is awesome. Yes. Welcome. 
We welcome them into the center of the universe, uh, but also to the full-time ministry here, leading our campus ministry. And so we are excited to have them here. And actually, we have some lovely gift bags for them. Swag bag, okay. And so you can, uh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff in there. There's campus shirts and everything else. Oh, hold it up. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, all right. So I just wanted to take a second to um, just, I'm, all, I'm so excited that they're here and super grateful that they both would choose to move to Worcester, to work in the campus with us. And um, I'm just already so impressed with them, their hearts, their joy, their zeal. Uh, I feel like God has given the Worcester Church, once again, a great big kiss on the lips and a hug with, uh, that's right, like a daddy kind of kiss, and uh, just, uh, but just loves us and knows exactly what we need, so I'm just so grateful for them being here. Amen. When my wife says kiss on the lips, that gets my attention. Oh, man. And also excited that the Bascones are going to still be involved in the campus ministry, being the campus ministry shepherding couple. So that's cool. And so it is, a, it's, it is great to have you guys here, and we know God will, will use you in a great way. What we're going to do is have one more song, and then Ida is going to come up and preach the lesson today. So. Yeah. 
Good morning, Worcester Church. Uh, let's take a, a second to greet our neighbors and show some hugs and some love. the whole earth. He marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that man would find him, seek him to be found and put in his master salvation plan. And for 21 years it took me to realize this. Lost in a world that says one thing is righteous but does the opposite. I was full of it and I was a sheep. Confused, lost, and troubled, blinded and puzzled, waiting for my shepherd to pull me out of this thick, deep, muddy puddle. But I had constructed my own destruction. I was born the last child of six, a pastor's son, but never afraid to take a risk. Church every Sunday wouldn't miss it, but I always shut up my mind so that the Lord couldn't visit. I grew up knowing how to speak and just what to say, and at five years old, boy, can I pray. At age 11, I was musically inclined, feeling like my talents were divine. I grew up feeling like I wasn't the same, like I had been set apart. What was different was my heart. Childlike faith consumed me as a boy, and I knew that God had given me this irreplaceable joy. And all through grade school, things just happened to work out for me, and this gave me the feeling that life was complete. But I was soon to build a Superman complex. Thinking that nothing could stop me, I became an immovable object. But I was soon to realize that this was only a cover. I was constantly striving to fill the huge shoes of my brothers or reaching nothing less than the PhDs acquired by my father and mother, and inside of me grew a spirit of failure like no other. But you would never know because I put on a grade A show. And now it was time for college. Armstrong Atlantic State University would test all forms of my knowledge. So on the first day of school, I walked in with my chin held high and my spiffy, spiffy cool bow tie. Okay. This was the start of my new identity. Not the man I meant to be, but the one society made me. So popularity became me. Joining several organizations on top of campus is where I wanted to be with the credentials of starting two organizations, a student unit building manager, campus unit board, SGA ambassador, collegiate 100, ultimate frisbee team, gospel choir, and a lot more that would add flame to my fire. I was at the peak of my desires, and I grew prideful and self-righteous. And the wolf, the dreaded wolf, began to attack me, and 
I, the sheep, ran into crisis after crisis, and instead of turning to the shepherd, I decided to confide in another sheep, even more lost than I was she, and I gave my life over to lust, sexual impurity, and selfish ambition, exalting myself to the king of these traditions. But to me, nothing was wrong, you know? I mean, I was still a good person. I, I didn't plan to be this way for long, and, and I wasn't as bad as, you know, the rest of those heathens, you know, the ones smoking pot, having orgies, and continually cheating, the type that profess Christ is loyal with their mouth, but say Christ equals world with their actions, Right, that's an improper fraction of life that's top heavy and incorrect and rational with a whole lot of Jesus at the top and a little bit of world at the bottom. They may have looked sweet on the outside, but their hearts are rotten. They may have been the prettiest flower, but when you got too close, you sneeze from their pollen. And they tell you that life couldn't be better as their soul awaits Satan's coffin. But then it hit me. I was judging them, but at the same time, sitting with a continual lust for more. Convicted deep to my core, but it felt good. So, so good, and I wanted more. And so, to the clubs and nightlife I went, and tipsy and drunk, endless money I spent, until I became mindful that I was a sheep, lost in the most worldly time fool. I became those hypocrites running around the school, a blind fool. Life looked upside down to the most humbling point in my life. I was kicked out of school. And for 21 years, I was separated from him. The one wall keeping the shepherd from his sheep was my own sin. The fear of failure that from a whole life had haunted me had caught me. Kryptonite had shocked me. I was depressed, angry, bitter, disgusted. My heart was ripping apart. I was a sheep, a lone sheep, a sheep that needed a shepherd. And so I began to seek prayers after prayers after prayer, until he sent me a sheep. But this one guided by the shepherd. He went by the name of Matt Weber, and he helped show me the word of the shepherd, what it meant to deny myself, take up my cross daily, and follow him. I began to expose my life of sin, connect with the cross and the shepherd's love through the crucifixion, repent and be saved through the sweet waters of baptism. Amen. September 2nd, 2012 was the day. Through faith, I was raised to the new life, the righteous way. But the shepherd said, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And after 21 years, I was finally united with the good shepherd, a so sweet love I had never felt. From him cometh my help. A peace which transcended my heart and immeasurably more peace of art. And for 21 years, he was here. He the good shepherd and I the sheep. And if you are a lost sheep like I was and so many others were, there is nothing to fear because the shepherd will move mountains to draw you near. So that's a, you know, a little synopsis of my story. There's a lot in there, so catch me in the fellowship to ask you some questions. Uh, if you didn't understand something in the, in the spoken word. Uh, today, uh, we're going to be talking about being devoted to one another. I was thinking about, you know, what would be a great thing to talk about? And one of the first things I love, right, when I, I came to the church here, is the word that was impressed in my heart was family. Yeah. This was just a, it was, it was a big family. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it really encouraged me seeing uh, the relationships that have been built here in this church. And as I said, you know, I'm, I'm the youngest of six, so family is something that I value highly. I love family. You know, we're going to break down uh, one verse today and, and look at some others, but one main verse. But I'm going to kind of pull you guys into my life as I share this sermon today. Uh, this is my uh, little nephew, Rowan. And the question is, well, what is Rowan so excited about? He has a little sister. Uh, this is Amara Benson Jaja. And uh, we were having a, a traditional Nigerian naming ceremony on this day. And what happens during this ceremony, right, is you have different family members and friends and people from the community. They come together and they bring gifts for young Amara. But also, right, we all bring a name that we think would be a great name for her to have. 
right? And so you might have the name blessings or the name favor, you know, or, or the name, the love of God, whatever that might mean in, in the culture. But the name of Mara was given to her, and that means the grace of God. And so at, at this, this naming ceremony, what we do is even at the baby's birth, we begin to honor the child. Right? And it's this culture of, of, of blessing her and honoring her, right, and, and praying over her for the life that she's going to live. This is a piece of my family right here. This is a uh, this is a, a going away party. This is uh, from my small uh, intimate friends. A lot of them me. A small going away party in Savannah. Some church, some family, and uh, they were able to uh, really honor me before I left Savannah. Romans twelve verse ten. It says, "Be devoted to one another in love, and honor one another above yourselves." You see, that was the culture as we were, you know, bringing young Amar into a new society where we were honoring her above ourselves. And even from that young age, we were, we were showing her and setting a pace for her life. Be devoted to one another in love. What, it, what does it really mean to be devoted to one another in love? We're going to talk about that today. So this is uh, me, and that's grown again, and young Amar. I am just holding the baby. Next picture, this is my brother Stoneman. He's also holding Amara. And this is Rowan. And he's holding Amara. Now, if you know anything about little kids, you know they love to mimic the behavior of adults. And even at a young age, Rowan sees myself, my brother, holding Amara, and he decides, I want to get on the action. I want to show her some love, too. And even at a young age, Rowan is learning how to honor his little sister. How to be devoted to love his little sister. Right? And it's it's this, this bigger image that today in the church, right, those of us, us, us who are older, remember that the younger are watching. Right? The things that we do do have an impact. Right? The next generation does look and see the faith of the previous generation of how they're going to live their lives when they fill your shoes one day. Yeah, right, and, and the easiest way to learn is through mimicking. That's what Rowan is doing right here. So this is the same verse, but a different translation. It says, be devoted to one another in a brotherly love, but give preference to one another in honor. Well, what does it mean to give preference, right? We all have our different preferences. So the question, do you guys prefer ketchup or mustard? Ke ketchup, all right, I'm a ketchup guy right here. You know what I'm saying? That's all, that's all I need. <laughs> that's what love me? All right, cool. All right, um, do you prefer living in the, 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 the north or the south? I hear some sounds coming out. Okay, okay. Depends on the time of year, right? <laughs> Do you, this is a controversial one. Do you prefer boneless wings or traditional? Oh, no. oh, no. What about traditional wings? somebody 
and pleasing somebody. Right? People pleasing is done for yourself. Right? This is done out of the fear of judgment, wanting them to like us or to, to gain our approval. But preference, this is done for someone else. Right? It means preferring them over yourselves. It means, you know, personally, I, I may not choose this option, but because I know that this is important to you, I'm going to submit myself to you at this time. You know, uh, back in Savannah, in the ministry there, you know, we're talking about controversial conversations. One of the most controversial conversations was after church su on Sunday was, where are we going for lunch? Oh. I mean, it would start with one person saying this. The next thing you know, it's an hour later, we still haven't made up our minds. Like, Yo, where are we going? I'm starving. Right, but what we have to do is in the group, we have some that were vegans, some who were meat lovers, you got some people who were on keto over here, you know what I'm saying? Some who were gluten free here, you know, some people who just, you know, are just picky, picky for no reason. Yeah. <laughs> like, hey, bro, you just pick where you're going. You, you take a spot and they're like, nah, let's go somewhere else. But we all are, are different people, right? We've come from our different places with our different backgrounds, our different likes and dislikes, and we all have our preference. Yeah. Where we have things that we like. The Bible calls us to give preference mm -hmm. to one another in honor, to be devoted in brotherly love. Right? It, sometimes this means humbling ourselves, and sometimes what we may think is best. Right? This, this may even mean, you know, as as th this next generation, you know, we have teens here, we have campus here, we have singles here. Things might not look the same uh, of how. Maybe how they see ministry or how they see God. You might be saying, you know what? These things work for us in the past. We're going to give you guys a second to, to see how you guys view God and how you view the ministry. Right. Now, we, we want to hear from you on uh, what's your take on how we're going to, to, to conquer the city in, in this, this area of Worcester. It might be giving preference to them with, with some of their opinions and some of their ideas and some of their thoughts. Right. Let's turn to the book of Mark chapter 2. And we're going to look at an example of where some men preference another man. Let's look at Mark chapter 2. We're going to start in, in verse 1, right at the start of the chapter. Look at verse 1. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come. They gathered in such large number that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to, to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Let's stop right there. Uh, this is one of my favorite stories in the New Testament. Right? And you see this picture. Right? And there's this man and he's on this para he's paralyzed and he's on a mat. Right? And the Bible doesn't explain if he asked to go to Jesus or not. But what do we see that there's four men? They must hear about Jesus and they see the condition of their friend. And they all come and get a piece of the mat. And it's this picture of unity. Yeah. Where in this moment, they at this time were thinking of, of him above their own needs. Yeah. Right? And what does this take? It takes Perseverance, right? They had to carry him. I don't know how long this distance was, but they were carrying him by foot to go and see Jesus. They get to the house, right? And, and the crowd is so huge, they have to go through the roof and they climb the roof and, and they're bold to get to Jesus. They're radical. They make an opening in the roof. You know, sometimes preferencing one another. Just take them to Jesus. Right? It, it, it may be as simple as sharing the word of God with somebody. 
You know, because when, 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 when pressing somebody becomes hard, it's when, you know, I see somebody who may be in sin or they may be down or struggling, but I don't really feel like going and talking to them. I, I feel like God is placing it on my heart to help this person. But nah, I got, I got too much things to do. I got a busy, busy schedule. I got things to take care of. And then what happens is we might see a need, but we're all waiting for someone else to take care of it. These men took initiative here. They saw a need, and they carried him to Jesus. But what, what I love is, you know, the men didn't try to change the, the person where, where he was. They didn't try to heal them on their own. They took him to him who was greater, to him who had the power to heal, to him who had the power to save. Yeah. Yeah. And that same idea. Are we taking people to Jesus? Right? In our small groups, we have to strive to give preference to one another. You know, we have to honor one another when it comes to our spiritual, but also when it comes to our physical needs. Right? Maybe it's as simple as praying and calling somebody and praying with your brother, praying with your sister. So another verse right here, it says, it's the same verse, different, different uh, translation. I love this translation. It says, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another with showing honor. Outdo one another with it. That's so beautiful. A question for you guys, have, have you ever tried to outdo one of your siblings before? I know growing up in my house, it was always a party, right? We were always trying to one up the next sibling, right? Uh, now, I'm the youngest, you know, with, with my sister, Kiri, she was always trying to outdo everybody else with her fashion sense, right? With my brother, Somi, it was he would try to get all these awards. Like, if you go in his room, there's awards everywhere. And he would try to outdo us by the number of awards he got. My sister, Joanne, she was uh, kind of like a goody two shoes. She would always clean the house. And then my parents would come and say, hey, I cleaned the house, Mom. It was horrible, right? <laughs> Sometimes she would even do our chores for us. That was good. But then we'd get in trouble because she did more work than she was supposed to. Mm. <laughs> so I was just for a second, y'all. All right. <clears throat> right, sometimes it can be for us to please, you know, pleasing our parents. And I remember specifically, uh, I was in high school, and uh, we put on this, this brotherly cooking competition at my house. And uh, we called it the Ja Ja Rib Off. <laughs> right, and so it was supposed to be inclusive of all the brothers, but the brothers were like, nah, you know, you're too young, you can't cook, so you're not a part of the competition. And so what happens is, uh, you know, they all cook these ribs, and uh, my brother Tuba won the competition and, because he knew his audience, right? He was cooking for college students, and so he made these sweet candy ribs. He just poured some sugar in the sauce. That's all he did. And all, all the students were like, yo, these ribs are lit. And I remember I was like, you know, we were always competing growing up, right? Little did they know, I was going to eventually learn how to cook and, you know, and, and uh, have another competition one day. But we've always had these brotherly and these family competitions growing up. You know, this past week, uh, the campus ministry, and before I share about it, first of all, the campus students are awesome. Right? <laughs> I, I don't know what you can say. Right, but the students are awesome. I mean, I've been able to hang out with some of these guys, and it is just having, having a good time. So we're, uh, this is Monday, the first day of uh, Campus Reach Out, and uh, we're over at Elm Park, you know, first time being this very beautiful park. You know, they set up the volleyball court, and you know, initially, the students are kind of just, you know, like, hitting the ball here and there, they're not really taking it seriously. But then out of nowhere, they turn up. And uh, they start talking trash, oh. right? And I was like, whoa, like, where, where did this come from? I remember after the game, Alex, who I thought was quiet, starts so talking trash to Marcella about how, how they just whooped them. And I'm alone, snap! <laughs> but yo, it was so awesome seeing them get outside of themselves and have a little good sport, have a little fun. 
what would it look like in a ministry if every day we were trying to outdo one another in love? Or what if we were trying to outdo one another in showing honor? I mean, this would be a crazy ministry, right? It, it would be okay. You know, the, the Caswells, they're thinking about encouraging the butts, and then the butts are heading to the Bastonis' house, and then the campus students are going over to the Bastonis' house, and people have the mind of, I'm going to take the initiative, I'm going to go and serve, I'm going to go and encourage. Like, hold up, I'm not going to let you outdo me in showing you some love, right? Right, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the one, I'm going to outdo you in my love for you. And it's like this godly competition that's going around. Right, where people, it's just like in the ministry, we see people are sparking up and they're trying to love one another. Right, and, and nothing's going to hold them back. Come on. You know, I remember uh, on the weekend that I interviewed here, uh, I stayed with the, the Castles for a couple of days, and uh, you know, I heard a lot about, about how great Tom was at Cornhole. Oh. I was like, all right, y'all. We're going to say that. We play a little Cornhole in the South. I'm going to challenge this guy real quick. You know, I'm a little competitive. So, we play some cornhole, and I mean, we're going neck and neck. Tom's sinking one, and I'm sinking one. And then, uh, you know, there can only be one winner in cornhole. Yeah. And uh, yeah. unfortunately, I had to beat Tom. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> now, now about, uh, about five weeks later, uh, I, I, I come here, and Tom, Tom calls and says, hey, bro. I want you to come stay with me for the first couple of days. I'm like, all right, cool. And so I get there, and little did I know, he was like, you know, I really actually come here because I wanted to play you in cornhole. <laughs> all right. So we go and play some cornhole, and I tell you, I do not lie to you, I promise, I bet Tom was probably practicing every day since I left. <laughs> Tom, he killed me. I didn't win one game. He must be like five times in a row. Like, like, it was horrible. And then he had the audacity to tell me he let me win the first time. Oh, I was like, wow. So we had started this, this competition, right? And I'm waiting to go back to his house to get some more of that cornhole. And, you know, uh, me and, um, <laughs> this is a, sorry, this is a, this is a, this is a funny one. But um, uh, me and Kara, we uh, decided to challenge the, uh, the best story to some basketball. Okay. You know, saying it's a two on two. And uh, we're about to, uh, it's about to go down sometime this week. But, you know, we, we, I've gotten here. I'm asking guys when they want to play. They're like, you know, we're busy. You know what I'm saying? Our girls just came back from camp. You know what I'm saying? We got to get our house in order. You know what I'm saying? All these different things. Come on now. All right, so, but well, I'm excited about this competition. Are we excited? about competing in love in this church. You know what I'm saying? Like, we're about to set the pace. I'm about to outdo my brother and sister in love. I'm gonna share a quick example. I don't know if you guys know, this is, this is my car right here. And uh, this was the, the first week I got here to Worcester. And of course, you know, Satan was trying to tempt the boy. And so we were, we were driving, and we went down a, a tunnel, and I'm with my brother Derek, and I catch a flat tire. I'm like, oh, snap. So get out of the car, and uh, we, you know, we pull up, we're trying to change the tire, uh, and then some cops pull up behind us, and they, they pretty much tell us, hey, you, you can't park it, but we're going to tow your car. Uh, now, mind you, Derek was on his way to uh, the airport. We're, we're dropping off at the airport. At this time, it's like 4 a.m. It's stupid early in the morning, and uh, we have to get to the airport. So we're like, what are we gonna do now? Because, you know, Derek has to get to the airport. All right, and this is a picture of Derek. <laughs> uh, let me remind you, all right, this isn't like, uh, I'm happy that the car broke down. This is like, Lord, please help me. Like, that's <laughs> right, and so, you know, th this is like his sarcastic smile right here. He's like, now mind you, the day prior, like, his flight had just gotten canceled. All right, so we're, we're, in the, we're in the tunnel, it's super, it's super early in the morning, and we're trying not to get stressed out. And so we pray together, and then this is what happens next, the, uh, the tow car, we, I call a brother who is in the Boston church. Uh, he picks up, it's like 4.30 in the morning, he picks up the phone. This is brother APL, you might know him, this is an Anthony Pierre uh, Louis. And uh, you know, he's like, bro, I got you, I'm coming. So he drives 
to meet us to where my car was. She takes Derek to the airport, gets him there on time, then comes back to my car, helps me take my tire to a car place. So I changed my tire, right? And, and you know, we had to wait a while, so I didn't get back to Worcester that morning, so maybe like 10 a.m., right? But I was so encouraged that out of nowhere, he decided, you know, I'm going to serve. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to help my brother. And he, at that moment, he gave preference to my needs. Yeah. Right? And he helped me, right? right? He, 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 he set the pace right there. And so once again, this verse right here, right? The, the Greek, the word is progumenoi. And it actually means to go before. So when it says to outdo one another and show, show love, show honor, it's meaning to go before as a leader, right? To set that example and showing honor. Right? And so it, it's, I'm going to, to set that pace of the love that I want to see displayed here in the church. All right, this is uh, Marcella and Lily, and they're helping our sister Kai move into uh, over there um, at Clark University, right? Already they're, they're showing her some honor, they're, they're, they're lifting her up, they're prefacing her above her, uh, themselves. All right, this is the campus ministry, right? Such a fun group, uh, this is a, a piece of the ministry, we listen to people here, but this was our, our last day, of the, uh, Thursday at Reach Out, had a great Bible talk on campus, and uh, what a fun, exciting group. This one says, this is the NLT, it says, love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring one another. All right, we were talking about that idea of taking initiative, right, and, and about setting the pace. You know, if we all wait around for people to encourage us, right, no encouragement, wow. it might not happen. Yeah. All right, you, know, you might be the person who's coming to church you're over here in the corner, you're like, man, shoot, I, bro, I want somebody to encourage me. I was like, I, I'm, I'm just going to wait here and, and wait to be encouraged. Come on. But it, it might not happen. Right? The heart that we should have as, as Jesus is that we should go before. Yeah. That we should come looking for the needs and looking for the service. You know, the, the world is tough. Right? You know, I, I get it. You know, we might have a hard week at work. You might have had a, a, a fight with your spouse on the way here. But it done poorly in your classes. You might have just had a horrible week. And you need some encouragement. Right? If we're all going out and looking to meet the needs of others, and everyone's needs are going to get met. Yeah. Yeah. we got to build that culture. Amen, bro. Amen. You see, when, when we're all sitting back, and no one wants to encourage anyone else, that's not the ministry of Jesus. Right? Yeah. It's, it's not what God sent Jesus to die for. Yeah. Right? If we look the same as the world, why do we even come to church? Right? If we look the same as the world, how can anyone see the difference? Why would anyone be drawn to us? Why would anybody come to us? Right? We have to set the pace so that the world can see and know that there is a God in heaven. Yeah. How are we going to set that pace? Of love in the campus ministry. I'm so excited about building this culture of honor. You know, and I was encouraging, you know, the Bastonas, is Felipe and Brandon. You know, when, when me, when me and Marcella got here, we met the campuses, we were like, oh my God, these, these students are amazing. Right? The Bastonas have poured so much into this ministry, and it's evident. You know, we got to the Bible talk, and the students were already giving. They were already going out and meeting people. They were already trying to share their faith. They were ready. Right? And it was so encouraging. You know, it's I just want to, one more time, let's give the best bonus a, a round of applause. I understand that I'm, I, I'm not coming here as if something was not already built. I'm just building on the foundation that's already begun. But yeah. right? as, as the torch, if my torch is being lit, I'm just continuing, me and Marcella are continuing mm. on the good work that you guys have put in here with the ministry. Yeah. You know, one of the, the best examples I think about of showing honor is, you know, is, you know, this kind of relates to what Tom was talking about last week was, was the story of Joseph, right? And, and 
you know, he, 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 we know he's the youngest of his, his brothers, and his brothers get envious, and they throw him in a pit, and later he's sold into slavery. And then we know he uh, eventually is able to dream. He's in, uh, he, gets, he gets to Potiphar's house. house. Uh, you know, but then something has happens with part of his wife. He gets demoted. Right, he's in prison. And then eventually he gets out of prison. And he's like the second in command in all of Egypt. You know, the Bible says that in Egypt there was no one greater than Joseph except for Pharaoh himself. But what does Joseph do? Right, when, when his life is changed, when God is elevating him to this position, right, when his brothers come during the famine, right, he, he could have decided to not help them out. He just could have decided, hey, you guys were the ones who put me in the pit. But instead, he gives them grain, he gives them food, and he shows them honor. Right, he prefaces them above himself. It says, love each other with genuine affection. Take delight in honoring each other. You know, that word genuine, right? Genuine is from the heart. It's not out of compulsion. You know, this type of love, right? You know, it's, it isn't conditional or based upon what we get in return. You know, that word love there, that's, that's, the, that's the philia. That's that, that's that brotherly love. You know, I talked to my brother Joe. He told me he was from Philadelphia. Right? That, that's, that's the word that, that, word that Philadelphia comes from, the city of brotherly love. Right, and when, uh, when that brother APL, you know, came to help with my car, he was showing that brotherly love. Yeah. But as sisters and brothers in Christ in a ministry, what does it look like to build this Jesus cultured ministry, this culture that we're delighting in honoring each other, that we're we're taking joy in showing. Honor. It's a ministry that shares the word of God with each other. It's a ministry that speaks the truth and love. It's a ministry that's full of encouragement. It's a ministry that's willing to serve one another. You know, when I got here last week, my first week at, at church, and one of the sisters of encouragement came up to me. She's like, hey, can I get your number? We just want to encourage you guys as your group, and we want to encourage the campus ministry. Right? And in this first week, I've already got some messages of encouragement from the sisters of encouragement. And they say, hey, my... Our, our decision in this church, we are going to set the pace. We're not, we're not waiting for you know, anyone else to encourage. We're going to set the pace. And I was so encouraged by those sisters. Y'all know who this is. This is Lori and Lily Madej. And so what happens is we had... <laughs> The Madej family is awesome. Uh, they have they have invited me into their home, and I'm I'm going to get to stay with them. I'm so grateful. <laughs> but uh, we went out to get some Mexican food, and uh, we had some time to honor Lori uh, for her birthday. And Lori is such an awesome uh, woman of God. She has invited me in as uh, become my second mother already. She's like, hey, she's calling me son already. And we got some Mexican food, and we just had a night where we we're just going to honor her and had some great, great time. And uh, me and Jerry have been having a great time. I get to, get to know him a lot better. And music, and I'm just, I mean, his quiet time, the things that he studies out are just like, oh my God. <laughs> right? It makes you want to get in the word, right? I'm inspired by his, 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 his love, right? He, he sets that pace in showing love, and it's inspiring to me being in the house. Amen. Um, they uh, got me a ticket to go to the Patriots game, right? <laughs> Over here for a week, and I'm already going to see the game, right? So I took Felipe's advice, right? I went to go watch some, uh, some New England football. Uh, this was yesterday. Um, I actually got a chance to cook some breakfast for uh, the Bidets, and uh, we got a chance to honor Lily. Lily was, was moving out of the house and going uh, to be a student at Holy Cross. And uh, made some quiche and some cinnamon rolls. A, we had a great, a great, great breakfast. We got to pray for Lily and, and really send her off. Right, and so we had this, this we're, we're trying to have this culture of serving one another, right? Of honoring one another here in the ministry. So got Romans 12. This, this is what gives us perspective of why we do this. Yeah. Romans 12, when it says, therefore I urge you Brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, 
to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and your proper worship. You see, as we serve one another in the ministry, the love doesn't just come from us. It's in view of God's mercy. Or that we understand that God gave us his first fruits when he gave us Jesus. That he didn't hold anything back for us when he gave us his son. And he gave us his all so that we could have life here and life to the full, right? An, an eternal life. A life that was going to continue on to heaven. Yeah. And what do we do in response? We offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. Yeah. You set that pace in love. We offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. Because when we accept the love of God and it overflows in our life, we can't help but pour it back out to somebody else. We can't help but give it to somebody else. We're, we're just so filled to the brim with the joy that comes from God. You know, in John 17, right here, you know, we see that Jesus... He prays. You know, first we know he prays for himself and he prays for the disciples. And then lastly, he prays for those who are going to believe in his message through him. Right. And this is that, that, that final piece of the prayer. It says, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also that those who believe in my message, who believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one father, just as you are one, you are in me, and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I and them, and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you have sent me and have loved me. Love them, even as you have loved me. You see, when we begin as a ministry, and as we continue to show the love of Jesus, right, when we have this culture of I'm going to set the pace in love, I'm going to give preference above myself, I'm going to outdo one another in showing honor, I'm going to be devoted to one another above myself, right, what happens is the world can see our unity. They can see the love of Jesus, and it's going to be this bright light that just shines through everything. And they're going to be like, what in the world is going on with that group? Right? They're a funky group that loves. What in the world is happening with this group? You know, they're just, they're just, they're just loving each other. One person's loving this, and the person's loving that. And it's going to be this, this group that's filled with love and encouragement. It says, then the world would know that you sent me. This is the picture. That the world would know that God sent Jesus. That he is a savior of the world. Yep. Amen. You ready? You guys know what this is right here. <laughs> All right. We got some clapping. Anybody know what this is right here? <laughs> Wait, I heard, I heard it. Popeye's chicken sandwich. Okay, somebody knows what it is. Well, they, they, they are out. Let me say, if you guys don't know what this is, I'm going to explain it to you. <laughs> So in the past few weeks on social media, there's been some craziness going on, right? Now, people have been making the claim that this chicken sandwich, or this spice chicken sandwich, is better than Chick-fil-A's chicken sandwich. All right, all right, all right. I know we got some Chick-fil-A loyalists in the room. All right, so I know this is some tough news for you guys to process. Right? And so it's been going crazy on social media that this chicken sandwich is outdoing Chick-fil-A's. Right? People have been going crazy over the sandwich. There have been fights that have been breaking out in Papa. People are trying to jump over the counter to get to the sandwich. Now, I don't know what they're putting in this meat or the sandwich. All right? But I was still like, bro, I need to try this sandwich. And so uh, me and uh, my boy Johnny Bidet over there, and uh, Aaron, we hopped in the car and sat there like, yo, let's go try that Popeye's chicken sandwich. <laughs> so we get the Popeye's, and uh, we're like, man, the line is outside of Popeye's way down the road. We're like, what's going on? And so we're like, all right, cool. Well, we went another day, we're 
go down to Chick-fil-A. We go to Chick-fil-A. You know, we're from Chick-fil-A a little bit of this over here. Go to Chick-fil-A, we, we, we get our fix. And then we're like, you know, we'll check it out sometime later in the week. And then what happens? The chicken sandwich is sold out. <laughs> I'm like, first of all, how is a chicken sandwich sold out nationwide? You guys are a chicken joint. How do you sell the chicken sandwiches? <laughs> First of all, uh, has anybody ever had this chicken sandwich here in the crowd? Oh, is it just one? Oh, snap. Okay, oh, we got two over here. We got the staff in the back. Okay, now, now, is the hype real? Yeah. The hype is real. Oh, snap. So you've heard it from your own people. <laughs> so, I haven't ever had this chicken sandwich yet, but whenever it comes back, I'm getting in line. But what does this make me think about? No. As people are spreading this news about something that's so, so good, it's, it's going viral. And there are reports that people who have never gone to Popeyes in their life are getting in the line. They're going to drive through, they're going to check out the sandwich. You know, we have this gift in Jesus. Right, this gift that's better and more, more delicious than anything else in this world. Yeah. Yeah. Right, if we share the good news in a way that, like, it, it goes viral, yeah. people who have never come to church are going to be showing up to the church's drive-thru. Wow. Right. Yeah. They're going to be like, y'all got that chicken sandwich? <laughs> We have something better. We have Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. People, people are lining up for this chicken sandwich. We have something better. We have Jesus. Yeah. We have an eternal gift. The chicken sandwich is sold out. Jesus will never sell out. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus will never run out. Yeah. This place is always full. This place is always full. He's the eternal spring. He's life to the full. Yeah. As we continue ministry this year, as we continue our lives with God, let's remember we have the gift that will never run out. That as we outdo one another in love, people are going to be running here and asking us for some of that Jesus that they're going to follow in our drive through. And they're going to, people who have never been to church before are going to be like, yo, I've got to hear about this. I've been hearing about this Jesus. We're going to be unified. Let's all stand up. If you can, if you can stand up, please stand up. Um, we're going to do like activity. I want you to find a, a partner that's right next to you. And I want you to turn and face your partner. And I want you guys to see which one of the two of you guys is longer. So hold, hold your arms out. And see which... Oh, the Mendez over here. Hey, Jared. See which one of the two of you is longer. All right, all right. So I said, stay, stay standing. Stay standing. So, this is how it can be sometimes in the ministry. We're always facing each other and trying to size one another up. We're trying to see who's longer or who has the more accolades or who's more spiritual or who's this or that. When the idea was always for us to show honest to one another. Now I want you to grab your partner by the, by the arm and I want you guys to stretch out like this. No, you are showing your partner. You see, when when you're not focused, right, on, on being better than your partner, you see that how long you guys are together. That, that we're better together. Right? So as, as as we as a church begin to show this honor, as we as a church begin to outdo one another in love, we're gonna be able to reach so many people. To God be the glory. Amen, church. Let's sing a closing song. Let's we'll sing Stand It Off. But before we sing, I want to thank you for the message. Thank you, brother. And to say, let's go live this out. 
Let, let's outdo each other in love and serving. Whether that's serving in Kids Kingdom, whether that's serving in Main Street, whether that's serving by having the campus kids over. Yeah. Um, let, let's live out what, uh, what, what we've learned this morning from the scriptures. And then we will all stand in awe. I saw him sitting over there. He's a big one. 